The Tulane Executive MBA program has given me the business acumen to perfectly complement my technical expertise, creating limitless career opportunities. I'm Claude Davis, principal scientist and official spokesperson for Zatarans. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base joneswalker.com and by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas and by Orange Theory Fitness, delivering fitness results for a healthier world. From Commander's Palace Restaurant in the Garden District in New Orleans, we're out to lunch with Peter Raschuti. Peter Raschuti is Tulane University's A.B. Freeman School of Business professor and director of the award-winning Birkenrode Reports. It's business, New Orleans style. Hi, I'm Peter Raschuti. Welcome to Out to Lunch. You may not be consciously aware of it, but you're constantly making decisions, starting with deciding it's time to get up in the morning till you decide it's time to go to bed at night. You're making hundreds, if not thousands of decisions all day. Now, most of these decisions are relatively mundane and you literally don't give them a second thought. But my lunch guest, Chris Cantrell, does. He's very invested in your thought process and your decisions large and small. Chris is co-owner of a company called New Orleans Perspectives. There are two main parts to the company. One part conducts focus groups to test out how people interact with consumer products, and the other part of the company assembles mock juries and allows lawyers to try out arguments and strategies before getting into a real courtroom. Chris Cantrell, welcome out to lunch. Thanks, Peter. Good to be here. My other lunch guest today is also in the business of sorting out the truth. Royd Anderson is a historian and documentary filmmaker who specializes in making documentaries about tragic Louisiana events that are overlooked by other historians. Royd's films include a documentary about Pan Am Flight 759, one of the deadliest plane crashes in U.S. history that occurred in 1982 in Kenner. Royd has also made documentaries about the Upstairs Lounge Fire in 1973, the Mother's Day bus crash in 1999, and the Luling Ferry Disaster in 2006 and others. Roy Anderson, welcome to Out to Lunch. Thank you, Peter. Honored to be here. Chris, let's start off with your consumer research. You test out products by putting people in a room and giving them a product to use while you and the client sit on the other side of a two-way mirror and observe. In this era of artificial intelligence where Facebook and Google seem to know everything about our likes and dislikes, the idea of doing research into a consumer product by looking at a group of people through a two-way mirror feels almost like something out of a bygone era. What kinds of products and clients are you working with? So you'd be surprised because almost any kind of product, almost any kind of client. It could be, I mean, anything from dog treats to medical devices. Your dogs in the panel then? We do not have dogs in the okay, panel. Okay, right. Dog owners. Come to that one. Dog owners. Dog owners. I, we're working on getting dogs one day. Sometimes kids, though, so that's kind of close. <laughs> uh, so it's really anything. If, if a corporate client wants to talk to people for any reason, it could be at the beginning. Maybe they have a new product they're thinking about putting out. Uh, it could, could be further down in the stage where they're looking at revamping some product packaging or thinking of a new consumer line of goods. Any reason they want to talk to people, they, they will get people in a room and talk to them. And you find the folks to be in that room, do they look, uh, are they looking for a diverse group or are they looking at the, uh, the market they're targeting? What, how do they put it? Anything and everything in between. Sometimes they're looking for a diverse group that is representative of the city. Sometimes they're looking for people who have used their products. Sometimes they're looking for people who haven't used their products. It's every single project has a little different specification. We do whatever the client wants us to do. And um, yeah, we, we, every project is different. And you were slash are an attorney. So you, you came up with this mock jury thing, which is, which is great. Uh, most people outside of the legal profession wouldn't kind of even know it exists. Tell us about it. Yeah, so mock juries are interesting because a lot of attorneys are turning to them when they haven't before. Some attorneys are skeptical of doing them at all, um, but a lot of attorneys love them. And there's kind of two groups of people who come to us to do mock trials and mock juries. One are trial consultants. These are people you might have seen on TV who advertise themselves as being experts in jury selection, like the TV show Bull. I don't know if yeah, anybody's right. familiar with Bull. 
Um, the other group is the attorneys themselves. So we work with attorneys at large, prominent firms, both nationally and locally. And their goals could be anything from having a full-on trial with multiple representative jury panels that they can kind of watch deliberate to sitting down with eight people and just kind of uh, bouncing ideas off of them, say, do you like argument A better or argument B? So really, with mock juries, it's anything the attorney wants to do with a group of people, we can kind of craft a solution for them that gives them what they want within a budget that's reasonable for them. Now, Roy, if your business model for making movies depends on things going disastrously wrong, living in Louisiana gives you a good measure of job security. Local disasters loom large in our memories, but I would imagine you can't depend on getting a big enough audience for a movie or enough financing to make a movie by relying on just Louisiana. When you look for financing and audiences outside of Louisiana, what kind of reception do you get? Do our local stories have resonance uh, beyond the borders? Oh, absolutely. You mentioned Pan Am Flight 759. There were 36 different countries represented on that flight. Uh, you know, 143 fatalities. So people in Europe are very interested in my work, The Upstairs Lounge Fire. That was the first documentary ever produced about this tragedy. Uh, shortly after that, you know, ABC News, a couple others did documentaries. But the whole, the gay community had no knowledge outside of New Orleans of this tragedy, which at that time was the worst mass murder of gays in U.S. history before Pulse. So it opened up a new chapter in, in gay history. And one thing that, Roy, that you're uh, quite a bit different on is you wait quite a while after the incident to, I guess, put the documentary together and to air it. Absolutely, because in the age of news today, there's so much news every day that the past tends to be forgotten. And I notice uh, that a lot of these tragedies of the past aren't in Louisiana history textbooks. It's not taught. And in, you're a history you know, teacher, yeah, so you know. Correct. Okay. So unless you make a documentary or someone writes about it, it's going to be forgotten. I learned a lot through my father, who was also, he was a, uh, a tour guide. He loves history. And he would take us around in the quarter and teach us, uh, you know, places like the upstairs lounge fire, which at that time when I saw it was just uh, a really run down building. And he said, yeah, that was a really bad there's, tragedy. There's no that plaque happened. there or anything there's like no, that. There was no plaque at the time. There is right okay. now. But uh, the the ferry disaster as well, you know, when I, I that documentary, that was my first documentary in 06 that served as my master's thesis at UL Lafayette. And that was shot during uh, Katrina, was which hit like the weekend of my first interview. And shortly after that, you know, my, my friend who was working the camera, she, she went to Memphis never saw her in like three or four years after that and a lot of my professors were encouraging me to switch and do Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, right. but I had a passion for this story, the Luling Fire Disaster that people from my generation don't know much about, people from younger generations, so I, 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 stuck, to, I stuck to it and said, look, no, uh, I want to stick to this. And I'm glad I did because ultimately they, they built a monument for the victims in Destrehan. So, Now, do you stay away from the ones that are gigantic and maybe got a lot of exposure? Like, you know, for a while here, we had, well, we had Katrina, the BP spill. For a while, it looked like we were living in the Old Testament. You know, it's, uh, would those be the kind of things, or would you be um, looking for something uh, maybe a little less known? Well, it seems like every day in New Orleans, you're, you're living history. Uh, I, I passed the, the Hard Rock Cafe, and I, I definitely got... I, I shot some video of it. really it. got me thinking now. Uh, this, this is endless, isn't it? And then, yeah, with, <laughs> with, with Hurricane Katrina as well, I, I had a long interview with uh, the governor, Kathleen Blanco, and I, I'm shelving that for probably in, you know, the 20th anniversary release it. But uh, I tend to focus more on things that have been forgotten, such as the Continental Grain Elevator explosion. Right. That was the deadliest grain dust explosion of the modern era. And it happened right in 77, river, yeah. 77 in uh, West Wego. So, uh, well, right. How much um, it, it costs something to produce these? Uh, where do you get financing? And where, second part, where do they air? Okay. Well, uh, it's really for a, a filmmaker. A lot of people stick strictly with the film festival 
mode, which I do as well, but television is very strong. It's a, it's a potent outlet that people sometimes overlook. Uh, Cox 4, Your View, all of my documentaries have been shown on television, and that channel is all, all throughout the Southwest, Lafayette, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, you get a really wide audience. And I also, as well, do the, the college uh, tour circuit uh, at Princeton. They invited me up there wow. years ago uh, for the Upstairs Lounge Fire, and I, I showed it there, I screened it. You the mentioned that, that, <laughs> that terrible incident a couple of times, and I, I just keep thinking that back when it happened, it must have been just it was a very different time in society, somewhat difficult to interview folks. Uh, nobody wanted to maybe come out for the, the interview, for instance. Exactly, right, because at that time, most gays were closeted. And since, you know, now that things have changed for the better, uh, we're getting a lot more information from that generation. But as well, many of them still do not want to be interviewed in front of the camera so it's it's kind of hard to get that history out but i'm glad it's out there and, yeah and absolutely they, chris do you ever do um i guess this would be kind of a natural but do you ever do political work we do a lot of political work we did a ton of work for the governor's race um both sides we don't yep. we don't pick sides although our clients generally are on one side or the other um, but we did a ton of work for the governor's race and we anticipate a lot of work for the presidential race. Um, they, they'll be doing market research and focus groups all over the country. And um, I know particularly Trump's people, since this is a good market for them, they'll be looking to do uh, a lot of research with their base here. And what would the research look like? Would it be those folks that call me on the telephone? It's not so much the polling. It's more looking at, uh, say, the effectiveness of campaign ads. So they might show, they might sit down a group of people and show them 10 different campaign ads and say, how do these make you feel? They, they, sometimes they'll have a little um, device called a dial and you can kind of live rate what you're feeling on a one to 10 scale. So if they might mark a commercial at 10, they love this commercial. They might mark a commercial a one, they hate this commercial. And so that way you can kind of avoid mistakes because sometimes even commercials that you think would be a slam dunk end up being surprisingly not really, um, not really effective for your target audience. So they do, they do a lot of research on that. And then they also do just some general messaging. They might um, think, well, what, what, are the what do the voters care about? So they'll ask them about education. Maybe they care a lot about education. They'll ask them about foreign policy. They'll ask them about, you know, whatever the hot button yeah. issues are. And that way they can uh, learn what the voters care about right now and use that to craft either their messaging or ads going forward. And just for the record, you don't make the commercials. You're just evaluating. Uh, Correct. Yeah. We're just on the research side. We're, we're, I, I like to think we're, um, we're pretty far down the chain and just helping facilitate people. We provide the space to do the research and the people, the, the focus group participants, the sort of average Louisianians. Those are the primary things we provide, not so much analysis or, or any sort of added on after that like a commercial. And one uh, thing that interested me is what you're doing from a business model perspective is that you, uh, you mentioned that only no one client represents more than, say, 10% of, of your work, which uh, is very good because you're not uh, dependent upon one. But I guess it would also uh, require going out and knocking on a lot of doors. You'd be surprised it doesn't require as much door knocking as you might think. <laughs> We've been surprised by that. Um, in the market research world, there are a couple of websites where you can go and say Google for a focus group facility. So a lot of times our clients know they're doing projects. We're not selling them on anything. They, they already know what they're going to do and where they'd like to do it. And they just, they just look us up. So the, by the time we get word that a project's happening, they may have already decided they're coming to New Orleans. And it's just a matter of, hey, here's this project we have in three weeks. Can you do it? And it often is literally two to two to four weeks is probably our typical lead time. So things happen in really quick turnaround. And you could, uh, I guess everybody asked you this, but you could scale, uh, go out of the area. I mean, I'm even thinking a lot of the law firms, the bigger law firms here have offices in other states. And so is that down we, the road? We are it? actively planning on um, expanding into a new, one new market out of Louisiana in either late this year, early 2021, and then by 2022, probably a second market. Right. Why do, um, why do history books 
miss out on these things. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm actually won't turn into one of those skeptics that I think on purpose they're kind of being skewed and leaving things out is, what do you think it is? I mean, these are fascinating. I'm seeing it more with contemporary history. You know, with Louisiana history, they cover a lot, you know, the Louisiana Purchase, you go up to the 70s, but they really don't cover like the disasters that occurred in the 70s. They don't, they don't, they don't, um, they're overlooked. It's a lot of the contemporary stuff is kind of just forgotten. Maybe it's during the school year or during like that's one of the last chapters in the book and it's really not uh, detailed. And it's funny because I think of you teach a middle school, is it? I do. Um, when I was in middle school, that would be what would keep my attention. Exactly. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> you know, I wasn't a great student, but if it was a couple of good disasters. Exactly. I, I taught at Hanville in 2006. And that's where the Luling Ferry disaster say, that's occurred. Right there. <laughs> and none of the students knew anything about it. Uh, the Pan Am crash in Metairie, the kids as well, they weren't aware. That it seems like the generations are forgetting about it. Uh, if it's not printed in the paper, if they don't do a story on it on WWL. So uh, there's a need to, to remember this history. That's what I was going to mm. get at. There's a real... Um, these shouldn't be forgotten because there were lessons learned, there were changes that needed to be made. Uh, right. It's more than just that that's a story dad used to tell or whatever. I mean, these are big deals. They probably made some changes that, that Mother's Day bus crash that, that led to changes in the way, you know, buses operate. And things, exactly. Because yeah. that was in 1999. That was 20 years ago. And at that time, seat belts weren't required. Whoa. So that was a big deal. That's why the majority of the people on the bus were killed. Plus, I don't know if y'all passed through that area. If you see the St. Bernard sign on 610, uh, there was a golf cart path that was constructed underneath the interstate, which was very, very, uh, they, they warned uh, the Department of Transportation not to do that, but they did as well. They did it anyway, and when the bus went off the road, it just dived into that. It was... It went airborne into this. Oh my! Uh, into this. Uh, you would be such a cool guy to hang out with. There's a, uh, you know, if you, you know, once you took the essential antidepressant medication, it was. Uh, these are. Uh, do you ever give tours? That would be an, another thing for your Royd. Kind of a grim tour, but but good. I don't. I, I think that a, a tour, giving a tour in those areas would. I don't. I think that they need to be remembered. For example, the the bus crash, there is no plaque or memorial there, and that happened in the city park area. I know that city park just received a lot of uh, income or wealth with their the last vote that went around. I think there should be a a plaque there with the names of the people who who perished. Uh, It's very difficult to get together. We'll get together right after the show. I've got, this is gonna be great. This is Pete and Royd's odd tours throughout the <laughs> state of Louisiana. <laughs> You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Peter Raschuti. I'm talking with historian and documentary filmmaker Roy Anderson and Chris Cantrell from New Orleans Perspectives. They conduct focus groups and mock juries. We'll be right back after this very brief break. You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Peter Raschuti. I'm talking with historian and documentary filmmaker Roy Anderson and Chris Cantrell from New Orleans Perspectives. They conduct focus groups and mock juries. Now, Chris and Roy, this is the part of the show we call your brother-in-law. You're on the way home after a long day at work when your phone rings and it's your brother-in-law. He normally only calls when he needs to borrow your pressure washer, but this time it's different. This time he's calling about business. He's got a great idea for you. Chris, your brother-in-law, says, have you ever seen the videos on YouTube of a kid who opens toys? He makes millions of dollars a year just from the views he gets on YouTube. Your brother-in-law says you should start a YouTube channel and it would be videos of your focus groups. Not all of your clients would go along with that, but for those that did, it would be great marketing. And all your brother-in-law wants is 10% of the YouTube ad revenue for coming up with the idea. What do you tell your brother-in-law? Is a YouTube channel of focus group videos a good idea? 
it would be a little bit of a headache to get the uh, permission from the clients, right? But let's assume, you know, we could work out, you know, kind of like those Chevy commercials, right? Where they oh, have yeah, the, you right. know, something like that. That guy always looks like he's with a cult, the guy that runs that yeah, it's, commercial. It's, a little, it's think... a little weird, but obviously it works. <laughs> so we could maybe go that route. But, you know, I'm thinking the costs of getting a YouTube operation started up are pretty slim. And uh, it would give me a lot of street cred with, like, kids. Because kids just love YouTube. So oh, yeah. We could maybe work that angle and we could get kids interested in doing other focus groups. And, and then, then it's just a cycle of they know they're oh. going to be on YouTube, so they're generating good content in the focus groups. But, you, I mean, I, I watch these groups all the time, and sometimes they are hilarious. I mean, they you, are legitimately entertaining a lot of What do you see in there? Are there people, their arguments? Well, you know, it's New Orleans, so we, we, get, we get characters. <laughs> um, and it's the combination of the clients from a little more normal cities, a little more laid-back cities, or not a lot laid-back, a little more uh, work-oriented cities, maybe. And so they get people... These great terms, Chris. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. I love you, New Orleans. Um, and they're just not expecting the kind of personalities they get. You know, we, we get people who own companies that sell musical instruments in there, and they're just talking about whatever they want to talk about and putting it in very New Orleans kind of terms and clients love it and it always it's an it's an inter, it's an interesting counterplay between the uh, the business like approach and the everyday New Orleanian. And are you looking for something um, obviously it's what they say and all that but is there like if you look into their eyes body movement is is that, that come into play? I think that's an aspirational thing to look at for clients, but these projects happen so quickly and the turnaround times are so fast and it's always on to the next project. So they'd like to think that and they probably do look at it more yeah. with um, in a mock jury context. You'll see attorneys like leaning into the glass, just studying every detail and they're, they're changing their arguments, you know, furiously scribbling notes in the back room. But uh, by and large, people just kind of take the audio recording, put, make a transcript and study that. I see things all the time where I think they just needed to run this by a focus group. Like, you remember, nothing against the Pelicans, but remember they came out with the first Pelican. He was a ferocious. And they brought him out in the court with kids, and the kids screamed, and they're now in therapy somewhere. <laughs> Kept thinking, 1-800-CRISS. Yeah, like Chris. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or the, ba the baby cakes. Oh, exactly. That's a scary guy, too. And just the name was dumb. Yeah. You could have... Cake babies. It should have been cake babies if you're going that route. That's just <laughs> king cake babies, cake babies, but not baby cakes. I, oh, I don't. Chris, you could have done so much. Well, they're gone now. Right, right. They're the. Are they the Wichita, Wichita. baby cakes? That would be just <laughs> pathetic, really, when you think about it. Now, Roy, your brother in law says he's got a great idea for your next project. It's called My Personal Disaster. Here's the concept you get local people to send you videos of terrible things that have happened to them or video they've captured of terrible things happening to other people. You edit the videos together in some clever, entertaining way, so you end up with a documentary or maybe a TV show. He says it'll be like America's funniest home videos, except this would be Louisiana's most tragically disastrous home videos. Your brother-in-law's actually not kidding. He thinks this could be huge, and you could scale it up, and you could do it for every state. Uh, what do you tell him? I would turn him down. It doesn't. It sounds like it's already been done. You okay. Know, like, uh, like, like you said, the the home videos, the America's funniest home videos. Uh, you would need, uh, and yours are bigger. You yeah, know, it's not just somebody falling into a pool or something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it may have a, an audience, perhaps, like on social media and stuff but it would you, you really need to be passionate about what you're doing and i wouldn't have any passion for that if it's about like making a buck or doing something like that i don't really have a passion watching people do goofy stuff on camera and put it on television I, I guess i'm just uh it's just not my cup of tea you're just a nice guy I'm a nice guy. And I, I, I hope people look at the photos here because you have the best bow tie in the history of Out to Lunch. Thanks. It's really, really nice. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, the, other part, the other part about the suggestion, really, uh, overall, is that I guess you don't want to come off as exploitive, right? Um, like, I think talking to Vic, not victim, but victims' families years later, that's got to be a sensitive thing to do. It definitely is. Uh, making that phone call, you know, that they've tried to forget the tragedy for so many years but in the end they're very happy that their their family and loved ones are remembered because through the years the media doesn't cover the anniversaries it's not taught in history class so they're relieved like wow thanks for remembering my father my daughter they're they're actually very 
content and happy that it's done to remember them. And done well, yeah. Right. That's, uh, and I, I guess there's some people that just don't want to think there's, about it again, but the majority want to help? Yeah, the, the majority of them want their, their loved ones remembered. Um, so it's been a positive experience, and it's a learning experience, because from what I can see with the with a lot of people moving in from different parts of the of the states in New Orleans, they don't know a lot about New Orleans history, contemporary New Orleans history. If you go to Barnes and Noble, Nobles, uh, there's a lot of literature on Katrina, but where are you going to find anything on the Ralt Center fire? Where are you going to find anything about the Luling Ferry disaster? So that's where people like myself and others come in to to fill the gap. In fact, fill in the gap, gap Royd, kind of reminds me of the fact that we've lost a lot of media outlets. I mean, it's a lot of print and everything. You're, you're kind of filling a gap here. Exactly. I mean, and don't underestimate the power of the media. Without the media, you can't promote your film. Uh, there's been a lot of people putting down the media, fake news and all, but they're, they're a great asset to, to filmmakers. They're the ones who promote your film. Uh, you were mentioning YouTube. Uh, I put my YouTube, tra- uh, the trailer for the Upstairs Lounge Fire, I put it on YouTube using a very inexpensive program, iMovie. The next day, I got like something like 70,000 hits and growing. It went viral. Perez Hilton discovered it and put it on his Facebook Whoa. page. And that's when the whole country learned of the Upstairs Lounge Fire. That so... Don't underestimate. You think it's expensive to make a documentary? No, not exactly. The Florida Project, that was a movie. Was a great movie. And yeah. it was all shot with a, with a cell phone. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it, it got nominated for, you know, for the Oscars and stuff. So don't think that, oh, I don't have the money. You do. PCs are very cheap now, too, these days. Get a good editing program, media composer, what have you. You can be your own filmmaker, but you have to have the passion. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. And you can't afford to have Brad Pitt be the, the captain or anything. No, no but he's, you know, <laughs> if he's available. If he's available in, in town, that He could be work. a good producer. I want to ask you each a question that I'm thinking about is, how did you get started in what you're doing? I mean, did you see that nobody else was doing something? Uh, Chris, uh, I mean, you're, obviously you're an attorney, so you saw, saw the need for it, but what made you think this could be a business? Well, my um, wife actually worked at what was our former competitor, so that would be one way to kind of get an insight into the business. Um, So she worked with them for a while, and uh, the opportunity became apparent. I think um, particularly in the mock jury space and the legal space, that was definitely underserved. I mean, we've found that clients who are using us now were just going to a hotel room before, and hotels don't have the two-way mirror, so... It's a whole different setting. You don't have a professional setup. You don't have any sort of local expertise because you're all just winging it yourself. Um, So we saw a massive underserved market there and at a healthy business, a healthy industry, Um, because at the time our competitor were the only, they were the only focus group facility in town. So um, the opportunity was apparent in a matter of months. And it also helped that I was an out-of-work attorney because I had been laid off after oil prices crashed. Oh, is we can take that out. Is I don't know. I'm only kidding. kidding. Roy, uh, were you one of those kids? Uh, let's say you're a history teacher, so we know that part. But were you one of those kids that just loved, uh, you know, cameras and things like that? Where did all that come from? Well, yeah, I, I went to Gaines High School. Uh, for those of you and who don't remember, that was A and G cafeteria. The G standard for stands for Gaines. And uh, I remember, that was a long time. yeah, one of my quotes was, I, I would make a lot of home movies. That was during the time when everyone had the big camera, the VHS camera. I w- I'd make a lot of home movies with my brothers and stuff. And my, uh, my grandfather uh, had a movie cinema in Cuba. So as a child, I was used to watching old movies and appreciating film with my, my mom and dad and grandparents. Uh, TCM's my favorite channel. So <laughs> it just naturally, uh, it, it kind of blended together. I like history. I'm also a musician. So the music, actually, in my documentaries. You do the soundtrack? I, I do the soundtrack. Oh, wow. That's a one-man band. Is a, now, Chris, I had, 
Where do you find the participants for the mock juries and the, the focus groups? Uh, so we cast a broad net. We have our own website where we have a big sign-up form. It's a pretty long list of questions. It takes about 10 minutes to fill so out. So you, uh, there's a big group you send it out to. Uh, well, we find people on Facebook first. Okay. So first step is signing up on our website. Then when people are signed up there, we have thousands of people now, right? Um, <clears throat> but when people are signed up there, when a client comes to us, they'll say, I'm looking for this demographic, household income above 50,000, let's say. So we can look to our database and we know exactly who's in Orleans or Jefferson Parish or wherever else with the requisite household income and the right age range. And then we take that list of people and call them to see if they're going to be a good fit for the specific project. If this show doesn't work out, I would like to be on that list. Yeah, you just okay. go to the website. <laughs> Easy money. We actually, in our first year of operation, we gave out just over $100,000 to Louisiana residents in cash for participation in groups. And in 2019, we were just over $300,000 we handed out for people doing focus groups. The one thing we all know about life is you never know what's going to happen. Things can be going along as always when suddenly one little thing happens and your whole life changes. It might be something great like meeting the love of your life at a bus stop, or it might be something tragic like getting hit by the bus. If it's the former, Chris might be able to contextualize it and make sense of it. And if it's the latter, Roy might be able to make a movie out of it. Chris and Roy, this has been a fascinating insight into two worlds most of us know nothing about. Thank you both for joining me today on Out to Lunch. Thank you. Thanks. My guests on Out to Lunch today have been Chris Cantrell. He's the co-owner of New Orleans Perspectives and Roy Anderson, historian and filmmaker. You can find and subscribe to the Out to Lunch podcast anywhere you get podcasts and on our website, itsneworleans.com. If you want to know what we look like, you can find photos from this show on itsneworleans.com and on our Out to Lunch social media. These photos were taken today by Jill LaFleur. You can find more of Jill's photos at LaFleur Photo. Com. Out to Lunch is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsneworleans.com and WWNO 89.9 FM. The producer of our show is Grant Morris, our technical producer is Eric Merle, and our researcher is Maggie Mendel. I'm Peter Raschuti. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to meeting you again next week around the table here at Commander's Palace for more business, New Orleans style, on Out to Lunch. Out to Lunch is recorded live over lunch at Commander's Palace in New Orleans. Commander's Palace serves lunch Monday to Friday, jazz brunch on Saturday and Sunday with live music, and dinner seven nights a week. Mitchell Foreman wrote and performs all the music on Out to Lunch. You can hear Mitchell's music anywhere great jazz is sold or streamed and at mitchellforeman.com. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com and by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas, and by Basics Swim and Gym and Basics Underneath Fine Lingerie, the It's New Orleans Happy Hour podcast, and by Orange Theory Fitness, delivering fitness results for a healthier world.